Want to have your own business but don't want to start from scratch? Franchising might be the answer you're looking for. Welcome to the Level Up with Nick Lopez show. The show that brings you thought leaders in business, franchising, and high-performance personal development. Whether you're a buyer, seller, franchisee, franchisor, or a consultant, find everything you need to know about franchising right here. Own a business without the pain and financial losses that come with creating it. Find the time, freedom, and financial independence you can have through entrepreneurship. Learn how franchising can help you get there. Listen up and get ready for another episode of The Level Up with Nick Lopez Show. Welcome to The Level Up Show with Nick Lopez, where we have the absolute pleasure of learning from thought leaders in business, franchising, and high-performance personal development. Today's guest had a very successful corporate America career working for companies like the Ford Motor Company. He's a multi-state franchise owner. He also routinely co-hosts the podcast show, Hire Yourself. And he is widely considered one of the world's top franchise consultants with one of the top franchise networks in Franchise, Mr. Pete Gilfillan. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Nick. Good morning. Awesome. I'm glad to have you on. Oh, I'm excited to be here with you. So you grew up pretty entrepreneurial. What was it like uh, growing up in an entrepreneurial family? Uh, well, my father and grandfather were Ford dealers. And so my dad was that local Ford dealer. And my dad was tough. Uh, he wanted us to learn to work hard. And so as a son of a car dealer. One, he had me work at the dealership. So I would show up and he would have me detail cars and, and go move cars and, and all that kind of stuff. One one weekend, he decided that I was going to be at the age of 16, going to paint the inside of the whole body shop. So I, I literally, he just bought, I didn't know anything about painting. He said, here's a power wash. I want you to spray everything down and then I want you to paint this. Uh, and I, I'll never forget that just the kind of the way my dad was, he was, uh, he wanted me to, to learn how to become an entrepreneur. So that was, uh, it was good. And he taught me to go out there and ask for it. So I played sports in high school. And so my father would literally say, go up to your coaches and tell them that your dad could help him get a car. So he had me selling or helping him sell at an early age. Mm. Ah, that's awesome. It, that reminds me of my family. Uh, we started a, a small lemonade company and uh, getting the kids to learn how to ask and negotiate and manage the operations. It, it's skills that I hope carries them throughout their whole life. Um, but, oh my gosh, in, in franchising, no one necessarily says, ah, you know, I'm going to get into franchising. In fact, uh, franchising generally finds you. And so, Pete, I was curious, uh, how did franchising find you? Yeah, so Ford is, in its uh, simplest form, a franchise. Although you don't buy it uh, from a standpoint, you are awarded the Ford franchise. So it's a little different than the traditional franchise. And so I grew up being a, a family member. My dad was the Ford dealer. But then out of college, I worked for Ford for 17 years. And one of the things I was responsible for was running very large markets. So I had a team of 75 people and I ran a market with 600 dealers. And so they were franchise dealers. And I really liked that aspect that they were dealers and they were strong. They were great business people. Car dealers are just absolutely amazing. Uh, they have to work very hard. It's a very complex business. And so I worked for Ford and then ultimately worked for Terex. I ran their global sales, which Terex is the third largest um, production um, uh, construction OEM, I guess would be the best way to say it. So I worked for that and I got sick of the corporate world. It just got to be too much. I had a young family. We were moving too much, too much travel, too much pressure. So ultimately I just gave it up, started deciding what I wanted to do next. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur like my father and grandfather. And so I bought the rights to a large, uh, master franchise in uh, the junk rule space, uh, specifically junk king. And so I bought the bought that, and and uh, that's how I got started in franchising. Mm. Ah, it's incredible. You know, I I didn't know that Ford Motor Company operated under that uh, framework. What were some 
wins, lessons, tips that you learned during your career with the Ford Motor Company? I think Ford is exceptional at training. So from that standpoint, they they did an exceptional job of training. And we got I got a lot of opportunities to to things that I couldn't normally run, right? Like run a five billion dollar sales marketing organization. You wouldn't get that if you weren't with Ford. But I think I learned that you just have to look at things, analyze them, understand what you got, and then make a decision and go forward. And sometimes Ford, we got caught up into the bureaucracy and stuff like that. But I had uh, the great opportunity to work for some uh, exceptional leaders, and they taught me just to, you know, look at the situation, figure out what you got to do, and let's let's figure it out. Hmm. So you, really, leadership, and it sounds like. Uh, some of the tips that you'd have is is listen, be coachable, and yeah. uh, you, you know really allow yourself to be molded by good leadership. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was a big part of it, and just understanding what is the situation, and then go figure out what you have to do, and then get it done. Hmm. So you rose through the ranks uh, throughout your career, you know, working for different Fortune 500 companies, specifically the Ford Motor Company. Uh, how do you, you know, clearly being coachable and um, being willing to level up was important. What were some other uh, strategies, uh, just basic things that you executed day in, day out that helped you be successful uh, in that corporate America world? Well, I think one, you have to work really hard. That's just a given and you got to show up. Uh, number two is I had a passion to always try to make something better. And so, for example, I was the guy uh, at Ford where I was the first one to take incentives to communicate the incentives to dealers. So like customer cash, APR rates, that kind of stuff. So I was responsible for all those for Ford and Lincoln Mercury. So I was responsible for taking an old system where we used to communicate the incentives through a batch system. We would put them in a computer system and overnight they would print at the, at the car dealership. So we were some of the first to actually go out there and post the stuff to a site for the franchise or excuse me, the franchisees to see. So I took all the incentives and took it off an old system and worked with a company out of New York to develop the system where we can communicate immediately incentives or upload them to a site in a way in which they could understand them and stuff like that. So that was really cool. So one of the things that I loved about the ability to get into these things is to try to understand what's your problem and look at a system and try to fix it or make it better. And so everything I did, I always tried to make it level it up from a standpoint, make it better, make it more efficient. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. what, what was eventually your, your role uh, with the Ford Motor Company? My last role was I was the general manager of the mid Midwest market. And so I was responsible for about 75 employees. We supported 600 dealers in 10 states. And our job was really to support these business owners, these Ford and Lincoln Mercury franchisees. And so that's what we did. Uh, and, and I love car dealers, obviously, growing up in that business. And so it was uh, it was an exciting uh, time at Ford. Unfortunately, we had the Great Recession in 2007, 2008. And, and that's when I left Ford. It was just it was time. They offered me a voluntary separation package. And so. Uh, I didn't, you know, I thought I'd spend my whole career there, but it was an opportunity to go start something new. And so I, I, I left for it. Hmm. Nowadays, when you drive by a dealership, uh, what are some thoughts that come to mind? I'm sure you're thinking about, you know, operational things and, and uh, just nuances that the everyday person doesn't think about. Do you ever drive by dealerships and have, have thoughts come across your mind uh, that, that pull from your career with the Ford Motor Company? Uh, no, sure. I've got a passion for cars. I mean, one of my favorite things to do is to go walk a lot. Uh, it's not so much fun today when these dealers don't have any cars. Like my my favorite Ford dealer, I think, has eight new cars on his lot. So uh, it was a difficult business before. It's a business that is continuing to change. And so I look at those dealers that have millions of dollars invested in their, their franchise business, that facility and all the people and all that kind of stuff, all the cars. And it's a tough business when they're not getting the inventory that they need. There's a, sh you know, the shortage of used cars because they can't get them uh, from that standpoint. And so you have that. And then you have the pressure from the manufacturers as they try to 
transition to electric vehicles. And so the, the model is changing. And I believe that some of the manufacturers don't understand the value of their franchise dealers. They have, I think, a huge asset and everybody wants to be a Tesla. But bottom line is Tesla does not have the network of dealers. And those dealers are the ones that when somebody has a problem with their vehicle, they send somebody out to get it, go help them, right? Like I had my car, the battery died in my garage. The car dealer came out, brought another battery, replaced it right on the spot for me. That's the power of a dealer. And so I look at those dealers and go, God, they're, they're great business owners. And I hope the manufacturers continue to respect what they have. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what what were some of those things that you did in that supportive role, right? Uh, you uh, ran multiple states and supported um, many different dealers. What were some defaults that you settled into, uh, things that you focused on for helping your franchise owners uh, level up? Well, they're all very strong. I think it's we're trying to always do our very best with the product that we had. Right. So the product is a given the manufacturer. We, we give that to the dealers and the dealers have to then merchandise it. So a big part of it is this ability to number one market. So how are you taking your tier two, tier three dollars and leveraging them to get the best exposure? Right. Number two is the customer satisfaction experience. We're always trying to improve that. And so if you could get the people in the door, you could give them a great experience, have great product right, which is a given, then you have a chance to increase your market share and everything is by market share, uh, getting your more than your fair share of it. And that in turn uh, makes you profitable. So um, clearly marketing, uh, return there, being efficient, uh, customer service and the satisfaction there, all for gaining market share, which I, I always talk about acquiring market share. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, just watching, uh, for us, it's lime green signs take over, you know, neighborhoods and communities. Um, but uh, what were some of those leading indicators, some KPIs that you focused on uh, that led to more market share, more customer satisfaction? Uh, what, what were some of the KPIs, just a few that come to mind that were important for you uh, that you'd put your thumb on? Well, I mean, the number one was our actual market share, right? How are mm -hmm. we gaining market share? But then you'd also be looking at dealers' customer um, scores or their customer satisfaction scores. And so you want to see that we're gaining share. Uh, we are satisfying customers. And I think other things would be is spend in the marketplace. Are you spending the money that you need to, to do that? Are you carrying the inventory that you have? Do you have the right people in place at your dealership? So it's a, a combination. But at the highest level, it's it's literally what's your market share? What's your customer satisfaction scores? How much money do you have in the market uh, from the standpoint of promoting your product? Hmm. Ah. That's awesome. Well, Pete, uh, clearly you were able to bring a, a lot of value to the franchise owners that you supported. And uh, unfortunately, the recession hit, as you mentioned, and um, you, you turned away from working with the Ford Motor Company. Uh, but ultimately, you didn't go back to corporate America. Why, why wasn't the corporate grind uh, for you? You know, I think from a standpoint is I had a young family and I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but it takes a lot to be in that corporate world. And and I loved it. It just, you know, and you can you can build those business. But the deal is, is that we were moving every 20 months and it was crazy pressure, crazy travel. And it just got to the point where I wanted to stay married and stay connected to my kids. It just it wasn't worth the money and all the great benefits and stuff like that. And again, I, I my blood was blue with Ford and, and certainly loved uh, the people at Terex. But but I always wanted to get away from it. And once I got away from the corporate world, I realized there's a whole different world out there that when you have your own business, you're in charge. So you don't have a boss. You don't have to sit through senseless meetings, right? Where if you've been in the corporate world, you could be in a senseless meeting for an hour and a half and it could have been solved in five minutes. And you're like, come can we just get this done uh, to not having to deal with politics or artificial objectives like, okay, we're going to hit this market share. Why are we going to hit that market share? Because that's what we want to hit. 
like, okay, are we going to hit that market share? Are we going to put additional resources behind it? What, what are we doing in terms of trying to get there? And so I found out that life can be, you can live life on your own terms and build something of your own where you don't have to put up with all that kind of stuff. So I kind of pinch myself every day as like, oh, I, I can't believe I've been blessed to be able to go do my own thing and not have to deal with any of that stuff anymore. Hmm. And ultimately, as you shared, you uh, ended up joining uh, Jan King Franchise Systems uh, and, and became a multi-state franchise owner, uh, excuse me, uh, Junk King uh, Franchise Systems. Uh, what are some lessons, some wins from your career as a multi-state franchise owner? Yeah, I, I only owned it for a couple years, uh, but what I really, the biggest thing I enjoyed about it is that I was a master franchisee. So as a master franchisee, your job is to go find franchisees for the three states that I owned. And I really enjoyed helping executives and couples go and look at investing and building the junk king businesses. And so that was the the biggest takeaway is I really realized that I had a passion to help others explore a path like I did, how I escaped the corporate world giving people also a path to be able to do that. Mm. So master franchise, uh, franchise owner, uh, that is a little bit different than a traditional franchise owner. Uh, what are some of those differences? Yeah, so you buy the rights to a very large area. So in my case, it was three states. And as a master franchisee, your job is to help find franchisees for those states. And the way in which you bring in revenue or you're compensated is number one, when somebody buys a territory in your market, if the franchise fee was $50,000, you may get half of that. Or a nice way to say it is you're getting some of your money off the table for buying that, that big area. The second thing is, is that your job is to help get those franchisees off the ground, help launch them. And for that, you get a portion of the royalty. So if the royalty is 6% of the revenue, you may get half of that or 3% going to you as the master franchisee. And you certainly can open up your own location, but the master is really about taking a large market area, finding franchisees, helping them be successful. And for that, you get a piece of it. What what are some tips that uh, you would share uh, to help somebody level up around that master franchise structure? Yeah, you don't see much uh, master franchises available today. Uh, you will see more multi-unit ownership. Simply put, I think there's so much more money in franchising right now that most franchisers don't need the capital or the assistance from having master franchisees. Or simply put, they don't need to give up some of the action to get the capital. So there's just so much capital out there today. So you don't see many franchise uh, systems that have a master like I did. So you're seeing more people looking to scale and build something with multiple multi-territory. So multiple locations from that standpoint where they, they want to go to the Dallas area and get seven territories or eight territories and, and build those out as their own business. Yeah, masters are definitely not very common, but multi-unit ownership is um, more so the theme, most certainly. Uh, so Pete, uh, share with us, what are uh, some of the reasons that ultimately led you to become a franchise consultant? Well, I, as I told you, when I was a master with Junk King, my job was to help find franchisees uh, for mm -hmm. Junk King. And so that got me turning. About the same time that I joined Junk King, I got the opportunity to become a franchise consultant. And, and I was kind of surprised because they're very selective in the people they, they take uh, to become franchise consultants. And so I got the opportunity to do that. And that's really where I found my passion. And I got the uh, franchise is an amazing organization, a great culture. They have exceptional training. And I really got excited about helping executives become entrepreneurs. And so that's what I started doing. I, I ultimately sold my master franchise at Junk King so I could put more time and energy into my franchise consulting business. And I've been a franchise consultant now with Franchise for over 11 years. And it's, it's my passion. I, I do it 11 hours a day because I can make a difference in people's lives. And, and if I can do that, um, that's just an awesome life to live. 
Absolutely. You mentioned that uh, Fran Choice is very selective and has an amazing culture. Uh, what are some of the aspects that go into making Fran Choice so special? I think it's one, the caliber of people. Again, they're very selective in who they take. And so it has to be a good fit. I think number two that separates them is they have exceptional training. So they take you through a pretty rigorous training. Number three is the is just the, the idea of the culture. The culture, everybody is trying to help each other grow, to become better from that standpoint. And you don't see that a lot, especially as you have what we do. It'd be very easy just to focus on myself, but we're all trying to help each other become better uh, from that standpoint. And so I think those are the three things of what makes it special. People, training, and uh, community, a high-performance culture. Uh, collaboration and and uh, being willing to help one another, more of a collaborative approach than a competitive approach, which, Absolutely. oh my gosh, any high performance organization, there there's a competitive nature, but it's, it's definitely not on um, the negative side. It's more so at a fun com- competition, but collaborations at the core and ultimately, that creates a winning organization and one that's full of momentum. And uh, I call it the yes train, right? So lots of lots of uh, positivity. And um, so, what other aspects go into uh, becoming and uh, day in day out being a successful uh, consultant? I think the biggest thing is this idea that you have to listen. And so I get the opportunity to talk to people every day and help them explore franchising. And it really does start with listening, getting a good understanding of what's important to them and what they'd want if they were going to take the path of investing in a franchise. And so that's definitely a skill. You have to be listening and asking questions and to be able to process that so that you come out of that conversation with a really good understanding of what the heck are they looking for? What what would be important if you were to invest in a franchise? So I think that's number one. I think number two is this idea to teach. So my passion is to teach. I'm a best-selling author of the book, Hire Yourself. I'm a podcaster. You know, I, that's what I pride myself as teaching. So I listen, understand what you're looking for, what you'd want if you were exploring franchising. And then number two is to teach you so that you are growing and you're learning as you explore this path of potentially becoming a business owner through franchise franchising. Mm-hmm. Listening, the power of listening. I can't tell you, Pete, how many times you've said, you know, be coachable and, and, and listen. There really is this um, posture of humility about you that I really appreciate. And uh, clearly it's, it's gone a long way for you. And I can't tell you how many times I talk about uh, and, and appreciate, um, you know, at the core of business in being successful in business is humility and uh, patience and um, putting yourself second and, and listening, uh, especially in a franchise system, as we're talking around, um, w- within franchising, this this posture of learning and it, it's combined with entrepreneurship, which is all about freedom. But yet, within a franchise system, you know, there's this aspect, this period of learning the model. Um, so, Pete, I'm curious. You've done plenty of listening as a franchise consultant and you've had the the privilege of working with many executives that are looking to make a transition into uh, business ownership. What are some of the themes that you hear as you're working with your clients? Are there typical patterns or, or um, nuances that you're constantly coming across? So one of the things that I ask people is, why the heck would you want to invest in a franchise? What, why, why do you want to take this path of becoming an entrepreneur or investing in a franchise? What most people say to me is, Pete, I, I want to take control of my destiny. I, I, I want to live life on my own terms. I, I want to create career and income security. I want to diversify my assets and income. I want to be able to have a flexible schedule. I want to build an asset I can someday sell or it could be a legacy for my family. You know, I just want to make an impact in the community. You know, I can't do that as an executive a lot of times because I'm on a plane all the time. I want to be 
engaged. I want to have purpose. I want to build, grow, and lead a team. So there's many different things, but at the core, it's really they, they just want to kind of build something on their own where they can be rewarded for their hard work and, and just go out there and make a difference. A lot of the aspects that you appreciated uh, coming out of your career and realizing about franchising, granted, the Ford Motor Company is very much a, a franchise structure. Um, so Pete, how has working for the Ford Motor Company and and junk king franchise systems, how have those things translated to help you uh, be a better franchise consultant when you're working with your clients? Well, I think from the standpoint as number one, I, I took the I took the path. So I, I left the corporate job. I left the very high pay uh, from that standpoint and ultimately became an entrepreneur. And I took a, the hard path. So I walked away from the income. I had a young family, but I walked away and started, put all my money into Junk King and no income starting up from day one, right? And so I took uh, the, I think one of the hardest paths to do it, and it certainly could be done. I did it from a standpoint, but I do like helping people explore that. Now, most of the executives I'm working with today want to do it from a standpoint of executive model semi absentee So they want to keep their corporate job. They want to keep their corporate income and they want to start the franchise on the side. They get the business going. They put a manager in place. They watch over that manager 15 or 20 hours a week. You always have to mind your business, but it tends to be an easier path. And so if I can teach people that path and it kind of explain to them and give them that opportunity to keep that income, keep, you know, keep that job and you're starting a business on the side. If I can help people have a little easier path to escape or create that diversification in their assets or income, supplemental income, build something that they can eventually then capitalize on in terms of selling to supercharge their fran- uh, retirement or even just have an income for their retirement. And retirement's not ceasing to work, but it's doing something you enjoy while still having a little money coming in. You know, there's lots of different ways in which you can do it, but I think that's the biggest one. Hmm. So Pete, how do you evaluate a winning brand uh, for your customer or for your clients? I think one is the leadership. So I want to know who, who's the leaders, you know, what's their background. Uh, number two is what, what have they done in terms of the product or service? What, what separates them from everybody else? What, what's their story? Number three is, do, do they have satisfied franchisees uh, from a standpoint? So my job is to kind of take and get a high look at franchises, but f- the person that's going to invest in the franchise, the candidate, it's their job to do the due diligence. Ultimately, it's their hard-earned dollars, and they're the ones that are going to have to go through what is called the franchise investigation procedures process, a series of steps that they get the information. So I can only get a feel for the organization. I can present that franchise to the candidate, but really it is the candidate's process in which they go and evaluate that business, do their due diligence, and they have to decide if it's a good fit. So leadership is clearly important. Uh, Differentiators in the market. You talked about acquiring market share. And clearly, the company needs to be differentiated and bring value in the market to uh, do just that, acquire more and more market share and have uh, a track record of successful franchise owners. Uh, what are some themes that you notice during that due diligence process that your candidates struggle with? Well, I think the biggest one is putting together the, the pro forma. Ultimately, they have to put together the kind of the financial evaluation or what do they think the business is going to do from a revenue standpoint, from expenses. And the franchisors can give them some of that information uh, through the FTD so they can gather some of the hard points, some of the numbers. But the back end of it or a lot of the numbers come from doing validation calls, talking to actual franchise owners. And that's an art to talk to business owners and develop enough rapport that you can ask them the financial questions and you get the answers from the standpoint. So I think it's one putting together the the pro formas is, is is big, and then number two is really kind of getting a feel for the franchise owners. The, again, that validation, talking to them to find out, hey, are they happy? Are they making money? And, and that that culture, and you'll you'll learn that from talking to the actual franchise owners. Hey, is this something that I want to join? Do I want to become a partner? Do I want to become a family member in X Y Z franchise? Hmm. Uh, you said something there that I wasn't expecting, uh, the culture piece, but even more so, 
there's an art, right, to um, pulling out information and and uh, really getting a feel for financial performance. Uh, do you have any tips for how to go about that art during that part of the due diligence process? Well, it's you're calling a complete stranger in a very short amount of time. You're going to be asking your financial questions, and what happens is people get to the point too fast. And so they just, they want to know how, how much money does this business make? What's the net profit margin? You know, how long does it take me to break even? And they're, they're all brilliant questions, but if that's what you start with and you'll hear that on group validation calls, I mean, it's just like, you're like, come on. So the biggest advice I give people is one build rapport, build a rapport, create a connection between the, the franchisee and you that you're talking to. And it can be simple as, Hey, how did you get into lime painting? Right. So it's it's building that rapport and then it's kind of easing into it by asking important questions and aren't intrusive. Example might be, how was the initial training? How was the, the marketing? Right. So we want to build that rapport, continue to build the rapport, ease into the questions, and then we can ask the financial questions. And if we put our work in up front, we got a pretty good chance of getting the answers to our, our financial questions. Hmm. And and clearly, you know, this is the value that you bring to uh, the matchmaking process. It's not as easy as X, Y, Z, and boom, you have a franchise. Uh, the franchise is awarded and uh, clearly you are in investigating a, a family and a culture. And um, there's so many elements that go into evaluating the business and, and there are so many options and how you go about it is uh, an art. Um, and, and so my goodness, Pete, uh, you, you do such an incredible job um, with this matchmaking process and uh, bring a tremendous amount of value to people that are looking to diversify. And, uh, uh, you know, clearly from your background, uh, you can relate. Um, so, Pete, uh, you, you also have a podcast show called Hire Yourself. I've always wondered, you know, why the name Hire Yourself? Yeah. Well, again, my best-selling book, Hire Yourself, uh, for obvious reasons, right? So, and I really, I set out with the book, Hire Yourself on a mission to help corporate executives take control of their destiny, live life on their own terms and, and build wealth. And so that's a book that educates people. It gives them a path to escape the corporate world, kind of like I did. So it's the blueprint. And so as a kind of an extension to that best-selling book, I, I really do enjoy educating and, and helping people explore franchising. And so the podcast gives me the opportunity to talk to industry leaders, uh, head of franchise systems, like you were on, on my Hire Yourself podcast, right? Great people like you. And then I also can just help people become better business people, right? Or this explore the path. So uh, talk about goal setting or how do we, you know, look at being an entrepreneur? What characteristics do we need to be a successful business owner? So I look at it as a way to continue to encourage people to explore the path of escaping the corporate world or building wealth through franchise ownership, but also a way to make an impact in people's lives. Hmm. And, and that stemmed from your your best selling book hire yourself or the podcast came first no the, the book the best selling yeah. book yeah yeah came first that's the foundation uh, for for uh, everything hire yourself hmm. so from the book which is a blueprint in this in this fast process complicated but i'm sure you simplified in that in that blueprint um, it, but from there uh, i'm sure there are Ah, oh, my gosh, so many different topics that you can bring on subject matter experts and dive in on this aspect or that aspect. Um, what are some topics that come to mind, uh, some favorite topics uh, from your Hire Yourself podcasts? I like to one talk to industry leaders like yourself. So if I can have you on and you tell your story and what makes Lime so special, right? And it's not a commercial for your franchise system, but rather it's for people to kind of get to know the leader of a, an organization to understand what makes them special as an organization, as an individual from a standpoint. So if I can, if I can do that, that's great. But number two is if I can give people fundamental skills or training, like how, how if I want to fund my business, how, how do I do that? Well, I have some a funding expert come on and talk a little bit about all the different options that you have. 
or you know what one of the big things tied to success is goal setting so we do a you know for lack of better terms a podcast episode on goal setting so it's really about kind of just bringing great content to people to help them grow to learn about franchises or just grow as business people or, or overall people hmm. I, oh my gosh. Yeah. Goal setting. Yeah. So simple, but again, one of those fundamental components of being, being a high performer and successful in business. You tie that along with, with uh, being humble and coachable and, and listening. Uh, it's definitely a combination. Some of the combinations that make for uh, successful entrepreneurial uh, journeys. Uh, so Pete, you've, you've clearly had uh, a vast uh, background and career in franchising, and, and you're still in it. So, uh, Pete, why do you love franchising so much? I like franchising because I look at it as entrepreneur light. There's so many people that want to become entrepreneurs, but they don't have the big idea. They they don't want to put in the hard work to figure out what the business model is and, and all that kind of stuff. They want to take the path, but it's not that easy. So franchising is a is a path that somebody has come up with the idea they've built out the business model they've tested it out so they've got a, a system and so you as the for lack of better terms executive or the individual you bring your business acumen you bring your capital and you leverage your experience your capital into business and you follow that system right so it's designed i don't have to be an expert in painting to become a, a line painting franchisee now, do I have to have some acumen and some leadership skills and some capital? Absolutely. So I come into a great franchise like Light and Painting, and I follow the system. So you tell me to do this, 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 and this. I follow the system, and I suspect I can make the system better. At a minimum, I got to follow it, but I got to make it a little better uh, from that standpoint. And if I can do that, if I can bring my skills and follow a system, I'm going to make less mistakes. And less mistakes saves me time, it saves me capital, and it improves my chance of success. Now, is a franchise guaranteed success? Absolutely not. But it improves your odds, and I'll take the improved odds by leveraging a good franchise system. Hmm. Yeah. Yet, uh, my gosh, well, well said. Uh, I'll add to that a little bit. Uh, so much of business is about uh, competing. And from a startup standpoint, a, a new idea or a new business, you're competing with established businesses that have already taken the arrows in the back, made the mistakes, lost the money, the time, figuring out the winning formula. And frankly, customers really don't care. Um, they, they're, they're wanting to put their money where they're going to get the best value. And so as a traditional startup business, that makes it very, very difficult. Um, and so in a franchise, that's already been done. And that playbook, that blueprint is there for uh, how to execute on the business model. You add in the training and the support and all the departmental um, aspects from the marketing and the finance and the technology, you know, that's all done. It's, it's more so uh, plugging into the system. And as you said, using your experience, um, coachability and ability to execute uh, to become a successful franchise owner. Granted, that doesn't mean that you don't have uh, the ability to innovate and improve the business model, but it's so paramount uh, to exercise that humility in that early season as you're adjusting, transitioning, and ultimately learning how to execute in a, in a competitive marketplace within a, a business model winning formula uh, so Pete, it's, it's been, it's truly been a pleasure. I feel like I could just talk to you for so long um, about all these different elements of business and, and franchising and high performance. Uh, I really hope that our uh, viewers uh, learned some things and leveled up. Uh, if anyone's interested in getting in touch with you, Pete, how could they do that? Uh, you can certainly go to hireyourself.com and just put in your information uh, from that standpoint. It's probably the easiest way to, to do that. Awesome. Well, Pete, thanks for joining on the show today. You got it. Thanks so much, Nick. It's always a pleasure uh, getting together with you. Uh, well, if uh, you enjoyed this show, please like, uh, subscribe to the show if you'd like to continue to level up uh, with myself and 
uh, our guests. Um, but more importantly, go into the comments and contribute to the conversation. Uh, we talked about so many different elements of business and franchising, high performance today. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. And as always, level up. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Level Up with Nick Lopez show. Remember, it's never too late to get started on your entrepreneurial journey. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share if you enjoyed today's segment. Catch us again next week and visit LimePainting.com for more of the Level Up with Nick Lopez show.